So tonight, we are going to be in, are you ready for it? Second Kings. We're going to the Old Testament. Yes. Yes. So Second Kings uh, chapter 6, we're going to be starting at verse 1. And like I said, we're going to be back in the Old Testament after taking a hiatus. Uh, I don't think over the past couple weeks, um, since I've spoken on Wednesday nights and even on Sunday mornings, we haven't been in the Old Testament, which is kind of weird because I, I love the Old Testament. It's, it's great. And uh, this evening we're going to be looking at a pretty crazy story that happened with Elisha. Not Elijah, Elisha. Um, but we're, I'm sorry, chapter 6. Chapter 6, starting at verse 1. But when you think about Elisha and Elijah, um, they, anything that they were a part of was pretty crazy. Uh, I, th- I think of my favorite story uh, with uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal. I've shared this many times. It's, it's an awesome story. If you haven't, if you haven't read it, do it. Uh, it's it's a it's pretty funny, <laughs> at least in my mind. But I have a really weird mind. So, um, but the event that we're going to be looking at takes place in the eighth century BC, and uh, it happened during the times of the kings. Hence, why we're in Second Kings. So, this is when Israel was split into two kingdoms: Israel in the north, and Judah in the south. And the two main characters in this text are uh, an unnamed prophetic student and the prophet Elisha, not to be confused with Elijah. So if I say Elijah by accident, know that I'm talking about Elisha. Can you guys hear the difference? (laughs) Elisha and Elijah, okay? (laughs) All right. Now remember, Elisha, Elisha, had been Elijah's attendant and student but when Elijah, Elijah, ja, was taken up uh, in chariots and horses of fire, being called up into heaven in a whirlwind, whirlwind uh, as the two of them were walking down the road. So Elijah was taken up into heaven. Elisha was left behind. And that happened actually in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. Since the time of Elisha had been God... Uh, since that time when Elijah was taken up, Elisha had been God's chief priest and su- successor of Elijah. I'm getting really tired of doing this. <laughs> but Elijah responded to the request by saying uh, to Elisha uh, when he asked for a double portion of God's Spirit in 2 Kings uh, chapter 2, verse 10. So keep your finger in chapter 6, flip over to chapter 2. Looking at verse 10, this is what it says after uh, Elisha asked for a double portion. You have asked for a difficult thing, yet if you have seen me when I am taken from you, it will be yours, otherwise it will, be, it will not. So Elisha actually saw Elijah taken up, so the double portion was his. And um, Elisha, his ministry was a ministry that would last for 50 years and span the region of four northern kings. And it it was characterized by many miracles. So what did he do? Why do I say that uh, that his ministry was characterized by many miracles? What did he do? Well, I'm so glad that you asked. Because I'm about to tell you. So Elisha parted the Jordan River and walked across on dry land. We can see that in 2 Kings. uh, And we're looking at things that are up until chapter 6. But he did that in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 14. So parting the Jordan River and walked across on dry land, he purified a large water supply in a town that was dying because of bad water. And that's 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Uh, something that we looked at a while ago, I think it was in my Sunday school class that we looked at this, Uh, but he multiplied oil for a poor widow. Maybe it was on a Wednesday night. I don't remember. Um, But multiplied oil for a poor widow, and uh, he provided for her needs through God. This wasn't Elisha doing this. This was God doing it through 
through Elisha. <laughs> so the next thing he did is that he raised the son of the, the Shunammite woman from the dead, and we can see that in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 8 through 37. And he fed a hundred men with just a little food and had leftovers. We can see that in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 42 through 44. Uh, he cured Naaman's uh, leprosy and captured a troop of enemy soldiers by causing them to become temporarily blind. How crazy is that? And we can see that in 2 Kings chapter 5 in its entirety. And these are just a few of the miracles that Elisha performed uh, up until chapter 6. So now compared to his great miracles, the miracle that we're about to read might appear as insignificant or unimportant. But, my prayer is that we'll see it as uh, a significant thing and as an important lesson for all of us. That's my prayer. And uh, we will also see this, uh, this incident gives us pr- some pretty important biblical truths as well. So, looking at 2 Kings uh, chapter 6, starting at verse 1 and reading through verse 7. The company of prophets said to Elisha, Look! The place where we meet with you is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan where each of us can get a pole and let us build a place there for us to meet. And he said, go. Then one of them said, won't you please come with your servants? I will, Elisha replied. And he went with them. They went to the Jordan and began to cut down trees. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Oh no, my lord, he cried out, it was borrowed. The man of God asked, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it there and made the iron float. Lift it out, he said. Then the man reached out his hand and took it. What? (laughs) Iron floating? What? (laughs) Doesn't make any sense. But... The text begins by telling us of a problem that the school of prophets had, and apparently they had grown so much over a certain period of time that their building was no longer meeting their needs. So they asked permission from Elisha to go down to the Jordan River where trees were readily available in order to build a new school. And Elisha said to them, "Eh, sounds like a good idea to me, you can go and do it. But not wanting to be without their teacher, one of the students asked Elisha, won't you please come with your servants? So Elisha and his students head down to the Jordan River to build the new schoolhouse. Okay. When they arrived, they immediately began to work on cutting down the trees. Each student was doing their part, and it was good work and a project uh, to train these young men of God. Teamwork, right? And you get to work with your hands. Sounds like a Tim the Toolman Taylor type of situation. Not many of you got that. That's okay. So, <clears throat> while the men were chopping away, one of them was chopping a big tree, and he developed a problem. It seemed that the iron axe head came flying off of the handle and flew into the Jordan River, sinking to the bottom. And this man had lost his axe head. Sounds like a joke, right? (laughs) But it's not. This man lost his cutting edge, remember that, cutting edge in serving the Lord. So let me ask you this question. Have you ever felt that you've lost your effectiveness for the Lord? Have you ever felt that you just aren't where you need to be in doing the thing that God has called you to Were you at one time swinging with great enthusiasm your acts of service for God? Then just chopping away with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I mean, you were really going to town with this thing and the wood chips were flying all over the place, knocking down the tree, knocking down another tree, knocking down another tree, and you were building the kingdom of God. However, somewhere along the way, you lost your cutting edge. You lost your effectiveness in serving the Lord. Let me say this up front. There is no greater work in all the world than building up the kingdom of God. There is no greater work in the world than building up the kingdom of God. 
and I've been in ministry for, full-time ministry for 11 years, and I'm still here because of that. There is no greater work than building the kingdom of God. Therefore, we need to be as effective as we possibly can be. And if we've lost our cutting edge, we need to get it back. And what this unnamed prophet from the school in 2 Kings did to get it back illustrates for us two things that will help us get our cutting edge back. And the first is this. We, like the young prophet, must admit that we've lost our cutting edge. We have to admit that we've lost our cutting edge. That was the first step the prophet had to make. He admit that he no longer had this cutting edge. He was assisting in the building of this school to train and teach young men for God, right? He was a young prophet. And they said, we've outgrown this. We want to make sure that other men are coming. And let's go build a schoolhouse. So that's exactly what he did. He went and he helped and he was assisting in building this school. And this school was an important work. It was about serving God. And the moment he lost his cutting edge, he was no longer effective at the job that he had before him. Right? Can you imagine taking a stick and trying to cut down a big, big tree? <laughs> it's not very effective, right? Right? So, to admit that we have a problem is the first step, and many times it's the hardest step. Right? Especially as guys, we don't want to admit that we have an issue. But <laughs> if we're married, our wives will point that out, that we have an issue. <laughs> right? Don't, don't answer that question. Don't answer that question. Yeah. <laughs> but we, we can see numerous examples around us. We, we're, admitting <clears throat> that, uh, we're admitting that one has a problem is the first step in healing an addiction, right? Maybe even admitting that one has a problem with healing a broken marriage or healing a broken relationship, whether that's at work or within a family unit or whatever. And there's a lot of other situations that we can, we can look at. Now, you may be thinking that admitting we have a problem is one of those areas Uh, And one of those areas is more significant and different than our text. But how else could the young man, young prophet, have reacted? He he had no other choice but to admit what he what what had happened, right? Can you imagine (laughs) uh, this young man being around his friends, and he's still chopping away at this tree? Can you imagine like the laughing stock that this this guy would have been? Like, dude, what are you doing? I'm cutting down the tree. You're not being very effective. Well, why not? Have you looked at your stick? Like, you've lost your axe head. So, looking at some, some other possible reactions that this young man could have had, had <clears throat> he could have been glad that he lost the axe head, uh, and he could, have, he could have used this as an excuse to quit working. Right? After all, he'd been working hard for a long time and he had done his share of work and now it was time for the others to do theirs. And he could have thought that he deserved a break that day. Or he could have refused because of pride to admit that he had even lost the axe head at all. What do you mean? I don't, I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. I can use a stick to cut this big tree down. Yeah. Imagine him continuing to chop, or rather bang away, with just the axe handle. Just going through the motions, just making a lot of noise, even maybe, even, <clears throat> maybe even breaking out in a sweat, but accomplishing absolutely nothing because he had lost his cutting edge. And did you catch the part in the passage where the young prophet even says that the axe wasn't even his? Oh no, it's borrowed. (laughs) Did you catch that? Why did he have to borrow it in the first place? Well, I'm so glad you asked. (laughs) At that time, iron axes were very rare and expensive. And being a student and a young prophet in training, he wasn't exactly rolling in the dough. So, if someone had loaned him the axe... He, if, if someone didn't loan him the axe, he wouldn't have been able to work. So if you think about it, our talents and, ab- and abilities, catch this, 
He was loaned the axe, right? Oh no, it's borrowed. If you think about it, our talents and abilities aren't ours either. Our talents and abilities aren't ours either. They're borrowed. They're on loan to us from God. And just like the young prophet, we have an obligation. We have a responsibility to the real owner of our talents, the Lord. So just a, just a couple weeks ago, <clears throat> I was having a conversation with, uh, with a young person about some of the talents and abilities that God has given me. And in my conversation with this young person, I told them that there was a time when I was playing drums at the church that I had grown up at, and uh, I began to think that I was all that in a bag of chips. I like chips. But I thought I had the ability to play drums. Like it was my ability. And the thing that I was doing, <clears throat> the, the things that I was playing, the way that I was playing, were only because of how good I was. What I learned very, very quickly was that when I started to think that my talents were of myself, I began to really struggle in my playing. And that's the truth. One time in particular, I remember sitting behind a very nice DW drum set. Sorry, getting technical here. DW drum sets are like top of the line. And the, the, the gentleman who brought his, because this, this was his set, he's been play, he had been playing for like 40 years. And I was amazed that he even let me touch this thing. But I remember sitting behind... <clears throat> this DW drum set, and I remember thinking to myself, man, and I, I'm, I'm in the middle of service. I'm playing during service, right? During the worship set. And I remember thinking to myself, self, you are really sucking right now. Like, you, you were really stinking this up. You're doing a horrible job. And it was because I, I had the mentality that what I was doing was because of me, my talents, my abilities, my playing. But when I began to play, from that moment, it, it was so, I, I remember it so vividly. I remember playing and thinking that, and then I went, hmm, Matt, that's not right. I remember centering, recentering myself and praying at that moment, saying, God, you've given me these talents and abilities. Help me to play in a way that glorifies you. And it's so funny what happened after that. You want to know what happened? I didn't suck. <clears throat> and it's because of how good he is and not how good I am. And that's any situation that we come in that, that comes our way. Like even even in your even in your line of work. If you think about, for those of you who are retired, maybe back to when you were in the workforce, <clears throat> think of a situation that, um, a talent that you had that you began to rely on your own power, your own thinking, and which direction did that situation go? Did it go this way? Probably went that way when you're relying on your own strength and your own power and your own knowledge, but then when you have a mentality that changes, takes an uptick, and even <clears throat> like, uh, like on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night, when I begin to rely on my own power rather than looking at this, that's, the plane starts to go down. So, <clears throat> what I do every Sunday is not because of what I can do on my own, it's only because of what God has given me to be able to do. I'm just a steward of the gifts that God has given me. And how I choose to use them is another story. And that's true for all of us. You see, God gives us each talents and ability so that we can assist in the building up of the kingdom. If we find somewhere along the way that we've lost our cutting edge or effectiveness, <clears throat> we're not doing much for the Lord. And let's not make excuses like this young man could have to continue our break. God has not given us permission to stop working for Him until we reach our eternal home. 
and that's heaven. Mary, you just had a great-grandchild born. Just because you had a great-grandchild born, are you going to take a break from helping instill God into that young, young man's heart? No. The ultimate goal is heaven for all of us. And we shouldn't take a break, especially because of pride. And it, we, need to, <clears throat> we need to look to God and we need to not just go through the motions of service with only an axe handle accomplishing very little work. Because maybe our cutting edge, our axe handle has flown off. Each of us has been given a job by God to do. And we're responsible for chopping down our share of trees for the building up of the kingdom of God. So, number two. We, like the young prophet, need to determine the spot where we lost our cutting edge. Determine the spot where we've lost our cutting edge. I don't know about you, but I struggle at times with misplacing things. Hmm. The other thing I struggle with is, uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I like to think that I'm too young for this, but the other thing that I struggle with is forgetting why I go into a room. <laughs> <clears throat> but that's beside the point. <clears throat> the problem of, uh, of misplacing things, it's, it's very frustrating. Very frustrating. And you know the best way to find something you've lost? Do you want to know what it is? It's trying to remember the last place you saw it. I remember when I was growing up, my mom would ask me after I've said, I, I don't know what I did with it. Where's the last place you had it? Oh, yeah, it was there. But the problem is with me, most of the time, I don't remember where the last place I had it was. <clears throat> so when the young prophet from our text realized that he had lost his axe head in the Jordan River, he went to his teacher Elisha and told him about what had happened. And in verse 6, if we look at this, <clears throat> Elisha responded by asking the young prophet, where did it fall? In other words, where did you have it last? <laughs> Now, the Bible doesn't give us a lot of details about this, and it doesn't say how long the man had been working. It doesn't say how many trees the young prophet had cut down. We just know that somewhere along the line, he discovered that he wasn't getting much work done. And, he was, and when he looked into his hands and saw that, uh, that he had been beating against a tree with just an axe handle, it, there came a point that he went, what happened? Where's the last place that it fell? And Okay, an axe handle, iron axe handle pretty heavy. So when it flies off the end of the axe handle, chances are he would have noticed it. <clears throat> but the young prophet didn't plan on losing his cutting edge. He wasn't trying to get into this position. It just happened. And <clears throat> isn't that the way it is with God's servants some, sometimes? <clears throat> I mean, they've been working really hard for a long time, chopping down tree after tree after tree after tree, contributing significantly to building the kingdom of God. However, somewhere along the journey, they lost their cutting edge. They lost their effectiveness in serving God. And like the young prophet, they didn't expect it to happen. <clears throat> but listen. Not to me, drink. Don't listen to that. <clears throat> <clears throat> if we ever get to this point, let's remember that if we want to get our cutting edge back, we need to remember where we left it. Because that's where it will be. Right where we left it. God is the unchanging one. God is the unchanging one. He will never leave us or forsake us. Once we remember where we had our cutting edge, where we left our cutting edge, we need to ask ourselves one more question. Why did we lose it in the first place? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Maybe, but I'm not going to answer that with certainty. So... <laughs> 
<clears throat> What's that? <laughs> but did it happen when we, we maybe became jealous of, of someone else and what we saw God was doing for them? Maybe it was when we became angry because we didn't have the things our way <clears throat> instead of God's way. Maybe we became angry because we were criticized by someone, whether it was deserving or not, instead of finding our identity in God and God alone. And I've, I've had many of those situations where I've had someone come up to me and uh, lovingly, most of the time, lovingly, and say, hey, maybe you should do this a little bit differently. And there have been times where I've gotten kind of pride-filled and go, what are they talking about? Like, why do they come to me and tell me that? But then when I take a step back and actually look at, oh, they said that in love. And that, yeah, I can see that. Has anybody else ever been in that situation? Yeah. What if we stop praying for God's will to be done? Ooh. What if we stop studying God's Word on a regular basis? If we try and take a deep, serious look at our spiritual life, we'll discover where and why we lost our service to the Lord. And if we ask God, <clears throat> we can be sure He'll help us find the answers we have to be trying to search for our own questions that we've been asking all along. We need to do our part in recovering the cutting edge and remember where we left it. And before we discuss what the man did to get his axe head back, it's important for us to study the part that Elijah played in getting it back. First of all, note that Elisha is not Houdini or David Copperfield. Okay? Elisha, Houdini and David Copperfield weren't even around. But Elisha is not a magician. Elisha was a prophet of the Almighty God. The power of Elisha had to, <clears throat> the power that Elisha had to perform these miracles and others was not from him. It was from God and God alone. Therefore, this miracle on the part of Elisha not only shows that Elisha was concerned about this man's problem, but more importantly, that God was concerned and that God cared. You see, men and women often lose sight of the individual. It's very apparent in our society when people <clears throat> are rarely viewed as people with real needs and problems. Because in our world today, we're often viewed as just statistics. Right? And that is not so with God. With God, we are not just statistics. <clears throat> this miracle that we read about illustrates three, three things. The first is this. That God is concerned with the individual. And this text is certainly not the only place where we see this, okay? We also see it in Jesus' Jesus's parable of the lost sheep, of the lost coin, and of the prodigal son. God teaches us that we are valuable to Him. The second thing that it illustrates to us is that <clears throat> with God there are no problems too small to bring to His attention. It the axe head could have flown off and it could have just been left at that and Elijah, <laughs> the, the, young, the young prophet student could have gone to Elisha and said, hey, the axe head's gone. And Elisha said, could have said, Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about your luck. But instead he said, where'd it go? Where was it left? <clears throat> and we, we need to remember 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, where it says, cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. Our Heavenly Father wants us to cast our cares upon Him. Yes, a man losing an axe head may not seem like a big deal, but God still cares. And then the third illustration is that not only does God care and is concerned about our problems, but He will help us solve our problems. God will help us 
solve our problems. He will not leave us high and dry. God will cause the solution to our problems to float to the surface, if you will. An iron axe head floating to the surface, you don't see that every day. And if we've lost our cutting edge of service to God, He cares for us, and we simply need to ask Him to help us. <clears throat> now, in the time that we have remaining, let's, let's talk about the young pro- what the young prophet did to get his cutting edge back and what it illustrates that we need to do as well. The man's work in his, uh, getting his axe head back didn't end when he admitted his problem. It didn't end there. It didn't even end when he sought help from Elisha. Nor did it end when he determined the place where he lost it. You see, the young prophet still had something to do if he wanted to hold the axe head again in his hands. Did you notice that Elisha didn't retrieve the axe head for the young prophet? Did you notice that? He could have, but he didn't. And why is that? Because God wanted the young prophet to be involved in the recovery. God wanted him to reach out his hand and retrieve it himself. Think about it this way. And we, let, me, let, me go, let me go to this. So, um, verses, six, the man, verse, verses 6 and 7. The man of God asked, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it there and made the iron float. Okay, so it's floating on the top of the water. But then, Elisha tells the young man, lift it out. Then the man reached out his hand and took it. So we see that. But think, think, about, think about these situations that I'm going to talk about. Martha, even though she thought Jesus was important and she believed that Jesus was important, she also thought that other things were just important, if not more so. Mary, her sister, thought that Jesus was the most important thing. And while Mary sat at the feet of Jesus listening to the words that Jesus was speaking, Martha was working in the kitchen, getting more and more and more upset with every turn of the mixer that she was making whatever she was making with because Mary wasn't helping. She, she was just resting at the feet of Jesus. And the Bible tells us that Martha was distracted from Jesus by other things. And Jesus, catch this, Jesus even says to Martha in Luke chapter 10, verse 41, this is what Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. The most important thing is Jesus. And the most important thing is kingdom work. This is why we should want to get our cutting edge back. And I want us to be honest with ourselves. Take a long, serious look at our cutting edge of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of, kingdom, for kingdom service. What are we doing right now on earth for heaven's sake? You can take that two ways. I'll let you decide which way to take that. What are we doing here on earth for heaven's sake? Are we like Martha being distracted by other things? Or have we taken on the motto of the world and asked what the world can do for us. Many of us, and I, as I wrote this, I was thinking about who actually probably saw this live. And I'm not saying that to be uh, disrespectful in any way, okay? Let me clarify that. But how many of you remember the famous, famous speech made by John F. Kennedy where he said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Anybody remember that? Yeah? Yeah. I just remember seeing it on TV and hearing, him, hearing about it in books. But this is my challenge for us today. Ask ourselves what it is that we can do for God instead of waiting for God to give us certain things. In closing, I want us to think about the story of Samson. And he's a good example of losing a cutting edge. He didn't even know he had lost it. In fact, he thought he could still defeat the Philistines by himself. (laughs) 
Scripture says, but he didn't know the Lord had left him. So he lost his cutting edge. Then the Philistines took Samson in chains and they gouged out his eyes and threw this once strong, mighty warrior in prison. And while he was in prison, blinded, he was forced to grind wheat like an animal. And I think you would agree with me uh, that at this time, Samson was not very effective for God, right? He had lost his cutting edge. Throughout his seemingly endless days in that prison, he had time to think. And Samson determined that what happened in his life had brought him to a low point. And because of that, Samson found that his cutting edge was right where he left it. (laughs) So he reached out to God, and he repented of his wickedness, and from his own way of living, and Samson returned to God. And after Samson prayed and God restored his strength, that blind, beaten man placed his hand on the giant pillars of the pagan temple, and what happened? It came down. The Bible says that Samson destroyed... I love this. Samson destroyed more of God's enemies when he returned to God than in all of the years before. It was a great victory. So, do you feel as about as effective in your service to God's kingdom as Samson did in the mill going around and around and around and around in circles day after day after day, just going through the meaningless motions? I want to I wanna encourage you in this way. Don't let another day go by with a dull or even lost cutting edge. Resolve today to allow God to use you in whatever way He sees fit. He sees fit. That's what I meant to say. Whatever way God sees fit. That, that, that's my prayer. That you would allow that we would allow God to use us in whatever way He sees fit. Because until we rid ourselves of ourselves, we will have this ever ongoing battle inside of ourselves. When we resolve every morning, and Andrew and I were talking about this just before church, when we resolve with ourselves before our feet even hit the floor every single morning that God, I am dying to myself and allowing You to live through me. To take up my cross daily and to be a servant for Christ. What is it that we need to do in that? There's something that Andrew and I were talking about earlier too. I'm not going to go into detail about it. But it's something that he and I have been praying for and Pastor Dave have been praying for for some time. And it's something that we believe is very important, but I don't have anybody that I think would be willing to do it. If you want to know what it is, come and talk to me after church. But I've just been praying because this cutting edge that has flown off the handle is pretty important. And I've been praying that God would, would... lift this piece of iron to the surface in someone's mind in a way that God only can so that we as a church body, as a body of Christ, not just NPMC, but a body of Christ, can be the light in our community. Just because Renata... Just because... Just because... Age might play a factor. It's a, it's a dull axe head. It's not a, a forgotten axe head. It's something that with God's help, that thing can be brought back to life. And it's, 
I will say this, and I'm not, I'm not saying you. I'm not saying you. But I've heard so many people who I love, who they get to that retirement age, and they say, I'm worthless. I can't do anything. I can't speak in anyone's life. But I'm here to tell you that I am where I am today because of people who were farther down the road of the, in their faith than I was. And it's so funny, and then I'll be done. Um, it's so funny because I was having a conversation with one of the pastors at the church that I grew up at because um, my, my vacation time that's coming up soon, <laughs> uh, I'm going back home. I'm, I'm going back to, not home, because this is home. I'm going back to where I grew up. And one of the things that I want to do is I want to go to the church that I grew up at. And I asked this pastor, I said, hey, can you tell me who's speaking on this weekend? Because not that it really matters. But um, he said, yes, it's, it's this pastor. And I said, great. Which service should I go to? Because I'm thinking about going to this service. They have three services. And do you know what, you know what this pastor said to me? He said, go to the early one. I said, why? He said, because all the people that you would know what he was saying was the old people. <laughs> All the people that you would know go to that service. And as soon as he said that, he didn't even have to say any names. My mind... My mind went to Jane Schember. She wrote me notes every month in college to tell me what was going on. My mind went to Vic Albert, who... Growing up, I called him the sucker man. Because he had a big bag of suckers. And after service, I would go back to the Welcome Center and I'd say, his, his last name is Albert. <clears throat> I would say, Mr. Albert, can I get a sucker? Of course you can. My mind, went, my mind went to so many other people. And even though I'm 33, almost 34, something that I've been so convicted of is who am I allowing to walk alongside of me? Who am I investing in? Going back to small groups, this is such an important thing. Investing in each other. <coughs> cross generation, cross, you know what I mean. Older generation, younger generation. Whatever <laughs> that word is. Cross generationally. There we go. But just, just because we're young or think we're young, because here's, here's the other thing. And then I will be done. <laughs> I remember when I started in ministry 10 years ago, and I remember going to regional pastors' meetings. And I remember walking into that room, and I remember looking around at all these other men in this room. And I remember seeing um, uh, uh, Paul Laux and, and Wayne Gerber and um, uh, Dennis Engbrecht and Dave Engbrecht and whoever else. I remember seeing these men and I thought, man, these are the guys that I want to be like. And now, I walk into those meetings and I look around and I go, I'm not the young guy anymore. <laughs> and I've, 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 told, I've told some of my peers this. I, say, I, I have said, it drives me nuts that I'm not the young guy anymore. And actually, I said this to one of my, one of my colleagues, one of my peers, from another church, and he said, Matt, don't let it drive you nuts, because that just means it's another generation that's coming up for the kingdom of God. Ooh, I could have smacked him, <laughs> but I didn't, because he was right. He was so right. So where have you lost your cutting edge? Where have you left it? What is it that maybe God is asking you to sharpen? 
I challenge you to ask God that. Where, where is it that you need me? What is it that you need me to do? I challenge you to ask God that. And listen to what He says to you. So let me pray for us and then I'm done. Father, thanks for tonight. Thank you for the time that we've had to look at Your Word and God, what it means to uh, um, trust You. And even though we might lose our cutting edge, God, You are right there with us every step of the way. So Father, in these days, as, as we maybe wrestle with what You have for us, God, whether it's investing in, in people's lives or uh, serving in a different capacity, God, whatever it may be, Father, I pray that You would help us to trust You and that uh, we would know and believe that You are walking with us every step of the way. So Father, be with us. Keep us safe. Give us a good rest of the week. And above it all, may You be glorified. And it's in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here.